Hey guys, I'm John P. And I'm Scott Ellis. We are going to trick out your yard in technology. Welcome to Geek Beat. I'm excited. We're going to have all kinds of geekiness, but this time we're taking it outdoors. I am super excited because this is solving a big problem for me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. So we have Daniel and Noel here from Sprinkle. Welcome to the show, guys. Hey, guys. Thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah, Glad thanks for here. coming on. People don't know, we're, we're actually we're actually filming this a little bit early because you guys are about to do a big Kickstarter launch. We are. That's right. Are. And uh, so I think we're going to have this ready to go. So hopefully you guys are watching it after the Kickstarter's already launched. So um, let's, talk about, let's talk about Sprinkle. What are you guys building? You've got all kinds of contraptions with you today, too. <laughs> Dan, Dan, go right ahead. Sure. So what we're doing is we're taking, uh, you know, your standard sprinkler system, and we're uh, making it smarter. So doing similar to what the Nest did for thermostat. So uh, I have a sprinkler system, and it's got a rotary dial. Programming, it's a pain. Yeah. So we wanted to, to improve it. So what we did was we took a touchscreen device that runs Android, and then we stuck on some valve control. So now we can control each of the different valves, the master, and then a number of different zones. So on Kickstarter here, we're launching with an 8-zone version and a 16-zone version, which will both run masters. All right, now at my house, I don't know about your house, but at my house, I've got a sprinkler, and like you were saying, it's got a crazy oh, yeah. dial, and you have to like go to this, you have to like go to set your station number, set your start time. You got to go back and forth and up and down. It's crazy. I can't even work it, and I think I have like three zones. So that, that was a big di differentiator in us. When we went to market, it was we looked at the existing technology out there. We listened to people, and people nowadays are used to a touch screen. They want something they can pick up, they can use. It's like an app. So we looked at the, the existing stuff out there. There wasn't anything that kind of fit that niche. There's some stuff now out there that actually has a colored screen, but it's not really interactive. It doesn't have a capacitive touch screen. It's not using uh, Wi-Fi to its extent. It's not doing any kind of smart watering. So you might see what Daniel actually has in his hands, the sensors. Um, these sensors themselves are actually measuring the moisture throughout the yard and relaying that information back to the controller for it to make accurate judgment on based on how much water to use. So it's calculating um, moisture levels, temperature, and some other metrics that it'll take in consideration when determining how long to run your period of watering. Okay, so that leads to a bunch of questions then. So does sure. this use Wi-Fi to connect back to the base unit, or how do these things? No. Dan. So these run 802.15.4, okay. so similar to what Zigbee is built on. So in Zigbee, whenever you uh, perform mesh routing, you have to have fully functional devices that are on all the time in order to provide message routing, those kinds of things for the mesh. So what these do, they don't run a full Zigbee because that consumes too much power. We power these things uh, for seven years off of a single lithium uh, AA battery. Seven That's years. Insane. Seven years. That's awesome. So it uses the capacitive sensing uh, is part of the other thing. Um, it's a very low energy type measurement, similar to how your finger interacts with your, with your touch screen. Uh, so it doesn't have any electrodes that need to make contact with the soil, but it measures a volumetric, um, a dielectric change that the water has in the soil. Okay, so I didn't understand any of that, <laughs> which is totally cool because I'm still stuck on my little dialy, you know, water sensor thing. So what, what we're gonna do is, for people who have an existing system, they're going to be able to remove that old controller and plug yours in place and then somehow get these sensors out in the yard to work with it? Right. So How does that work? Our idea is to make this very simple, something that uh, my grandmother can figure out how to install. Uh -huh. So your sprinkler system has a number of wires that come up. Yeah. What we'll do is this is a complete retrofit for an, for an existing system. So if you have a house and a sprinkler system, this could be for you. Um, you basically take off your old sprinkler, you unscrew the, the screws, you unscrew the wires, you yep. leave them basically there, you lift them forward. You'll take... Um, and then you got like a whole bunch of different colored wires, like, I don't know, eight of them or something <laughs> right. like that. So actually the best thing is to take a picture with your phone before okay, you yeah. start, and then you know where everything goes. Yeah. Uh, and then you'll put on the face plate, which is the power connection for our sprinkler system. You'll land the wires for each of the different zones. So you'll say, hey, what was connected to zone one? We'll just connect right back to zone one. Okay, zone they're two usually zone labeled. Okay. Like in the they're, controller, they'll labeled. say zone one, and yeah. there'll be like a red yeah. and a white sure. or something yeah, and like so that. Yeah, so you take the yellow one that was on yeah. zone one, and you plug it into our zone one. Okay. Uh, and then at the end of that, you plug in the face plate, and it powers on. And then you get to name your zones. And so instead of having to figure out, okay, I've got zone one, zone two, yeah, on my garage. Yeah, I have no idea what they are. <laughs> on my garage, penciled in on the drywall <laughs> is <laughs> zone one, yeah, flower bed <laughs> zone two. And you know what the worst thing is? If you want to go turn one of those zones on, just one of those zones on, you got to go and like turn some weird dial to like 
start and then you got to wait a minute and then you got to then it starts and then you got to go figure out where it is and you got to come back and stop and go turn to another it's weird yeah it's super right. frustrating yeah, too it is even it is. for geeky people like me oh, yeah. it's really hard i so, spent an hour this summer trying to figure it out in the middle of summer standing in my garage yeah, just 100, sweating 110 to death degree and i just gave up i had to call somebody to come out and do it because it was just not working right so. okay so we're gonna take the wires and we're gonna you got a little plate mm -hmm. that will screw onto the wall, right, attach the, the wires plate. exactly where they were before. Like yep. a thermostat. Yeah, so like you install the plate first, you wire into the terminals, and they're little push terminals, so you don't have a screwdriver or anything like that. You just push them in to each terminal. Oh, nice. Pop the face plate on. And bingo. You know, yep. But you're saying we're going to get even more functionality because we've got these little thingies that we stick in the yard, then we're, we're, we're gonna have more functionality than we did with the old one. Right, so when I moved into my house a few years ago, it already had a sprinkler system. Uh, I imagine some lawn guy probably commissioned it and you know, dialed in each zone, yeah. how long it ought to run. I moved in, I don't know how long these yeah. things are supposed to run, so I set it for 15 minutes each zone. Uh, if that's water too running much, down the uh, street, right. it could be, or maybe you know I've got some patch that, that's not getting much water. Yeah. Um, so this closes the loop. Uh, so this is one of the other, um, I think that's probably the key uh, uh, differentiator for our product within this space is that we use um, wireless sensors to close the loop. So you can put this in an autopilot mode. Uh, you put the, you know, you take the sensor, you'll wave it in front of the, um, in front of the, the panel, and it'll, um, through a magnetic sense, be able to see that oh, something's trying to pair. It'll pair to. That's uh, it. Oh, really? Yeah. So the, the wait, handshake so, is. Wait just a minute. Hang on. Let me get this right. So like, I would just go like this. It's in the much. tip, but yes. Oh, oh, go like this? Yeah, <laughs> pretty and, much. There's going to be a power like, switch. Okay, when, they, when they ship, there'll be a power switch to turn it on, so it's not wasting power Oh, on this thing would have a yeah. Yeah, power. Yeah, a little switch. Okay, that's fine. So switch we turn on, on the power. Sync it up. Sync go it up. like that, yep. and it will sync. say something like, oh, do you want to sync this de this device? Or It'll something? say, new sensor, you know, uh, scene. And, and I say, yeah. And you say, yeah, and then it says, what do you want to call it? Where are you going to stick this, basically? Oh, I'm going to stick it in my flower bed. You punch in flower. You know, and it associates it with the zone that is the flower bed zone. How many can um, I put in my yard? So one per zone is what we're recommending. Okay. Now, does that depend on the size of the zone? If you have a bigger zone somewhere, would you need more sensors, or so this is, is something that we're looking at it? for a stretch goal within the Kickstarter mm -hmm. of uh, potentially uh, pairing multiple zones. So this is more of a software control type issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's a little difficult because sometimes you know you only have one valve, and so. Maybe you average it. Um, oh, yeah. We recommend large uh, uh, sticking it uh, in the middle of any um, elevation change so that you try and average out uh, some of the needs of the soil. And we're okay. going to take two measurements. We're going to do one at a seven inch and one at a two inch. So then we can get the root level system, how moist it is down at the root levels for some of these grasses like St. Augustine and some of these deeper root systems or uh, Bermuda uh, once it's established. And then also at the two inch level, and then we're going to send all that data back and kind of figure out what's optimal for that. So if I, if I wanted to go crazy with this, so like I said, I think we only have three zones and I have a big yard, like half an acre with not enough zones, I don't think. So if I wanted to go crazy with it and have, you know, eight zones, then could I just call a sprinkler guy out to come and like add in some extra zones or something? Would he have to run wires and then, then we could plug them into here and I could sure. even increase it? So traditionally, yeah, you would need to run wires. You call someone out. Mm -hmm. um, you still can run wires if you want to. Uh, one of our other stretch goals for Kickstarter is a, uh, a wireless valve retrofit. So your standard uh, valve box cover, you know, the circular green valve uh -huh. box cover that, that sits in your yard. Mm -hmm. Uh, what you can do if you're a um, adventurous do-it-yourselfer, uh -huh. uh, make sure you cut off you know the main power or the main um, the water uh, to your sprinkler <laughs> yeah. system. But you can basically break your your main line where the valves tee off of, install a standard valve, uh, and then install this retrofit valve cover that takes solar power, charges a lithium-ion battery, and uses the same module that's in this for communicating on the wireless mesh. You won't have to run any more wires, so. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, so, so, no so in my case, I'd right. have to burrow underneath my driveway and a sidewalk to <laughs> yeah. run a new zone yeah, to the flower yeah. bed. And I'm like, that's just crazy. You're not doing that all Yeah, yeah who's going to yeah. do who, I, you're, And it's going to cost you a thousand bucks to get somebody to come out and trench all that and yeah. do it. So, um, I mean, we're, so, we're wait, basically taking something that, that plumbers would normally have to do or trenchers, and we're putting it in the hands of the consumer. So, so, does that mean that if I wanted to add like four or five different controls, then assuming that the stretch were to, to hit, right. you know, you guys are able to do this development, then we'd be able to just go dig up uh, a spot in the yard, um, cut into the PVC, yep. uh, Absolutely. stick this sucker in there, it'd have its little solar thing, and bingo, you bingo. Got it. And yeah. the way the, the relaying works for the mesh is, no matter how far out it is, it's going to relay that signal as long as you have sensors or 
these, uh, these retrofit valve controls in line going up to your controller. So they'll piggyback off each other to make it sure it gets from your acre lot, you know, the very back of it, all the way to your controller in your garage or in your, in your house for that matter. That is really cool. Okay, so I'm noticing there's a couple of different lengths here too. Sure. So what is the the thinking behind? Right. That? To clarify here, lengths? this was a um, an original prototype. Okay. So this was a, a generation two. We have another one that was just a bare PCB as we were you know building out the technology. Two, actually, two <laughs> PCBs. Yeah. We originally started with resistive and saw that um, this is more what's traditionally on the market right now. Are you know you see two little metal stakes that go into the right. yard. A lot of times, like a uh, yeah, a little pitchfork, something like that. But if, um, if, if on the surface of, of the turf there's a continuous water path, that thing pegs out, right? You have a perfectly conductive path between the two. Yeah. So it's kind of more of an all or nothing type sensor. With the capacitive, we're able to, to sense uh, gradations so we can see smaller percentile changes in the moisture and close the feedback loop. So this was one of the, um, the sensor uh, uh, testing for both the PCB fit and the, um, and the form factor as we were doing the 3D modeling for the case. This is the next generation. This is much more uh, close to what the final, um, final product is and it's the the seven inch sensor. Okay. So and we you do. Said that that'll have two sensors in it at different depths, or you'll right. have two different yeah, kinds. Yeah, you can of, see sort so of. So there's yeah, there's a yeah. small port where wire will wrap around oh, okay. um, on the outside. So there's one here, and there's one uh, at this level, and one at this level. Okay. Gotcha. So about an inch in, and then uh, six inches in. Interesting. Okay. Will that be? Will you be able to eventually learn, like for example, how fast the the water is penetrating the ground by, by doing that? So we're going to aggregate this data. Yeah, so what are you going to do with all that to data? Keep the, to keep the battery, the battery life at, at what we're projecting, we're going to, I mean, the, the readings is going to happen, what, every 15 every minutes? Every 15 minutes. So if you were to do it more frequently, it's not going to last as long. So every 15 minutes, we're going to record all this information. We'll use it to calculate your watering pattern going forward, but we'll also save that off for historical reporting reasons. So you can go back and see, well, now, you know, I've, I've installed this type of turf or whatever, and now the, the moisture levels are a lot better or stable over time. I'm not getting as much runoff or, or something like that. Yeah. So that data will be pushed back and we'll be able to use that for some uh, reporting. And hopefully when the water valves for the cities get a little smarter, we can start tying that back in and tell you your actual irrigation water usage. Oh, that'd be sweet. So, so that actually, I'm glad you brought up cities because one of the things that we deal with, and I know a lot of cities do, is you can only water on certain days. There's right. a lot of watering restrictions. All that kind of stuff. So, is it going to be easy for me to go? I don't even know in? what days I'm allowed to water. I just water. We get we get I'm trash a day, I think. Um, <laughs> but again, I don't always remember that, and I have to go in and reprogram things. So, is it going to be sure. easy for me to go in and change things up as I need to say, okay, these are my restriction days or things Absolutely. like that? Absolutely. Um, I don't know if I can uh, get it where it can show, but so we actually have the weather restrictions baked right into the or the weather watering restrictions. restrictions baked right into the controller. So uh, for cities that we'll actually go around and implement, and we're gonna start here locally in the Dallas area and kind of branch out from there, uh, we'll have a city portal that these cities can log into. They enter the restriction data. Your controller will suck down that information and based on certain rules, your the odd number, your street address, your location in the city itself, we'll determine what days you're allowed to water and what days you're not. Of course, you can override this if you are a rebel, like in John's case, <laughs> but we, uh, we do recommend, obviously, for conservation reasons to kind of follow those guidelines. Um, I would follow in all fairness. It's just it I, have, I don't, I don't know, know where it is. You know, I, I don't. I don't know when, how to find out. So we're going to find out. Sounds like you may not need to know. So if I yeah, heard you correctly, this is if the city uploads their data, right. it's going right. to automatically say, exactly. okay, don't water on this day. This is not your data. And well, it's better push than it that. To you too. It's right. better than that because if you've got sensors in the ground. It doesn't have to necessarily follow some ridiculous actual schedule, right? right. I mean, one week it could water, uh, you know, one time, and another week it could water no times, and another week it could water two or three times. It just needs to maintain. If I just say I want this to be completely automatic and I don't want right. to think about it, will this take over that? It this will, flow. and as long as the restrictions are hooked in, because the cities yeah. they. There's still some really rough guidelines, I guess, around ET controllers and what they allow as far as if you can go outside of the watering restrictions that are in place. So with that said, I don't think they'll still want you watering on days they say you can't water. Yeah. But our system will, if you're in one of the cities that we recognize, it'll automatically handle that. Well, that's what so, I mean. Yeah, like if, right. it's in da if in Dallas, let's say I'm allowed, to, I, I'm allowed to water, I don't know, let's say three days a week. Sure. then the system knows, okay, I can water these three days. These are my windows of opportunity when I can water. Right. Right. And then you're taking the, the reading so you know whether, you, whether the grass actually wants the water or not. Exactly. So that's part of the thing. And how the, much of it did it wants, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So this is a smart controller, and we're able to implement best practices for watering. So uh, one of the best practices is to water for a few minutes and then let that soak in and then water again. So what happens is you have people that are on... 
uh, three, let's say three day a week watering. Uh, and so on the days that they can water, they look and they say, my lawn's not doing so well. And so they and will peg it, they will just yeah. drench it. And there's this ton of runoff. And actually that hurts in a lot of different ways. I mean, you've got runoff, uh, you know, it does uh, soil erosion, you get more stuff into the drainage. Yeah. Uh, and you also lose nutrients. So this will be able to say, hey, I only need to run this much and it can perform these soaking cycles. Uh, one of the other interesting things is that we haven't talked about is um, the programmable API that we have. So for instance, um, this has a, it runs a, a web server and has a REST API. So if you are more tech leaning, mm -hmm. uh, if you're familiar with web technologies, you can integrate this with your other home automation uh, hubs or um, anything that's home brewed. As far so, as I know, all the, all the irrigation controllers that are on the market that are these smart irrigation controllers, and by smart, I mean they're just Wi-Fi enabled. This is what we came across when we were looking at our competitors in the space. Um, none of them really publish an API. Well, Daniel and I both come from a really from an open, open source, source kind of yeah. open hardware background. We want to give that logic and that availability out to these developers and let them build cool stuff. And that's the whole idea. We want it where if you open your door and your sprinklers are on, it shuts off when you go to the mailbox and then resumes right when you're done. We want to make it where you can write your own technology to water your foundation levels. Yeah. And that's just some of the things that we were thinking about. We're like, how cool it'd be to make custom, ear, you know, you can set a sensor on your foundation, write your own monitoring, so your foundation may need different water than our automatic algorithm thinks, and it can figure out, and, and you can do it all based on the code yourself. So we have a little Ruby library that you can use to write code. We're gonna have a Java API, uh, or client API that you can use. Right. Um, and we'll this thing's, the rest, yeah. yeah, and then, yeah, they'll just use the I'm rest thinking, specification. I'm thinking Bellagio style oh, uh, yeah. watering. <laughs> you could, card. you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. You can sprinkler system. <laughs> I love it. You can hook it on a motion detector and get the trick-or-treaters. <laughs> nice, yeah. Soon, so. <laughs> yeah, the other interesting thing is, I mean, this hardware is actually very hackable. And we, uh, again, want to engage with the, the, the maker um, type, uh, type community. And so, I mean, you could actually have this control your aquarium, if you wanted to, of setting, uh, you know, getting your water level right. But, uh, you know, you have the sensor, you can pull the sensor data from, from the API, and so you can know, hey, let's go ahead and add a little bit more water through some automated system. You know, nice. this drives the valves, top it up. All right, so speaking of being a rebel, I'm just going to ask the question because I know somebody else is going to think about this. What's to keep my neighbors who have the same system from pulling out my sensors and putting them in their own yard? So we're going to phone when they're home. they're jealous of when, my when, awesome When you're added, we're going to push it to our cloud, and we'll know that that's registered to you. So the first person that syncs it owns it. So if you we're having to steal one from Lowe's and you sink it, it is yours, sorta. <laughs> but if you stole it from your neighbor and went and tried to sink it, it's not gonna work. It's gonna phone okay. home, say hey, and then we're gonna tell them that your sensor got recognized at a different location. Oh wow, so, so I can go over to my neighbors and say, hey, I want my sensor back. We probably won't be recording any GPS information. <laughs> we're kind of security advocates too, so <laughs> we're, we're big on what we're actually storing, uh, okay, a real anonymous enough. data. But we will know that it doesn't belong there and we're gonna throw up some stuff. And probably what we'll end up doing is have you call a customer support number if you want it. Yeah. You want it, that flag removed. Yeah. So, you can, yeah. so if you did move or buy a different unit or whatever and need to replace it, then we can track it that way. Okay. So That sounds a lot. Uh, that sounds great. Now, uh, the biggest que question of all is, what is this thing going to cost us? Like, you know, <laughs> what's it going to cost to put this thing in? And really, can I do this myself? Sure. Uh, the answer for do it myself, yes, definitely. Um, I'm a do it yourself where I do a lot of my own home repairs. Uh, and so we want to make that available to people instead of having to rely on some, uh, some third party. Uh, in terms of cost, we are targeting uh, $259 for the controller on Kickstarter here. Um, and so that would be for the controller alone. And as you add sensors, uh, we discount things a bit. Uh, so it does scale. Uh, there'll be a lot of stretch goals that will also roll out um, as we hit different uh, levels. And we intend to, to engage with the community a lot um, throughout the campaigns. The campaign is 30 days, and uh, we want to share, you know, uh, what we're developing both uh, in business relationships with, with various um, home automation groups, those kinds of things, as well as um, our, our technology developments. Excellent. Awesome. Cool. Well, you guys know where to get it. Head on over to kickstarter.com and just do a little search for Sprinkle. S-P-R-I-N-K-L. That's right. Is what you need to look for. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed this particular episode. We're going to uh, wait until these things come out, and then we're going to, we're going to, I think we're going to, uh, Hack the Geek House. Uh, oh yeah, these are definitely going in the Geek House system. Maybe even I'm gonna, our, I'm gonna code it so that whenever Giovanni's walking up the front, they go off. I'm thinking our sprinkler system inside Ooh. in Geo's office. Even better. Even better. I love okay, payback. thanks guys. We'll see you later. Have a good one. Thanks.